This week's episode of Astonishing Legends is brought to you by Blue Apron, eHarmony, The Great Courses Plus, and our contributors at Patreon.com. It's time for the final part of our series on the Yeti. Last week in part two, we covered more of the legends and lore surrounding this beast, including its connections to local religious beliefs. We shared the story of the missing, astonishing Pangboche Yeti hand, a finger of which was smuggled out of the country by none other than Jimmy Stewart and his wife Gloria. Tonight we dive hard into one of the most thorough investigations into what the Yeti is that anyone has ever done. The 60-year search, undertaken by a man who grew up in the Himalayan region and became fascinated with the creature at a very young age when he first saw the Shipton footprint. His book, Yeti, The Ecology of a Mystery, details a search that is so much more than a journey to find the cryptid that left that footprint. It's the journey of his life, and there's so much more to it than the relationship between him and this creature. Through his efforts to determine what and where it was, he became one of the leading conservationists of the Himalayan range, sparking new methods of protection for the land that were adopted by nearly every country those majestic mountains are part of. We don't always get to say this with things we investigate, but when tonight's show is done, you will know what made the iconic Shipton footprint but you will also come to realize that the Yeti is so much more than just that footprint or the creature that made it. Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. Authentic wildness is found in choosing to walk home in the rain, embracing the absence of control and letting it soak into you. Wildness welcomes us whenever and wherever we want it. Daniel C. Taylor from his book, Yeti, The Ecology of a Mystery. Join us tonight for the final part of our series on the Yeti in our last show of 2017. And we're back. Well, folks, it's uh, Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or Krampus time. <laughs> Choose your <Sure>. tradition. <laughs> and uh, Forrest and I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. We are so truly grateful to have you. You really are the best fans in the podcasting business, and we couldn't ask for a better audience to interact with. By the time this episode drops, I'll be with my family, and Forrest will be with his. Uh, where is that again, Forrest? Somewhere cold. All right. Uh, <laughs> but we, we wanted you to have something to listen to over the holiday break, so we timed this show to coincide with that. This is like the first time we've done something like this ahead of time, isn't it? Possibly, yes. (laughs) Well, let's not waste any time. Let's get down to business. When we started this series on the Yeti, as we always do, we seek out the best written material on the subject at hand for what we can find. Well, actually, Tess does that. She seeks that out. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) (laughs) No, we have her uh, audition stuff and go vet some materials, and and there were just a few choices I think she came back with, and she hit the nail on the head on this one. Yeah, she really did. Uh, Tess, by the way, speaking of another thing we're grateful for. Absolutely. our head researcher and right-hand woman, she finds this stuff for us. And the one that she tapped out for this topic was Yeti, The Ecology of a Mystery by Daniel C. Taylor. I'm not kidding you when I tell you I could not put this book down. It truly was amazing reading and and so fascinating. It was like a cross between a Rudyard Kipling adventure and Indiana Jones. And I greatly enjoyed the vicarious travel I was able to undertake through reading it. And I, of course, wanted to reach out to Dr. Taylor for an interview, and, and you always hope for the best when you do that, but imagine my surprise when he actually got back to me, and quickly. <laughs> so I got to say, I found him very, not only very easy to talk to, but somebody that I wish I could spend more time around. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, you know, I think it was one of your best interviews. I think I said that at part oh, one. That's, Seriously. That's too kind. Thank you. Uh, a lot of it because you took the golden rule is to, uh, it's better to uh, not say as much and let people think you're a terrible interviewer than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a, <laughs> it's well sorry, that was a, wow, well, that was a mashup. It's not surprising that he was easy to talk to, frankly, because he's an educator and yeah, that's exactly. what he does. Yes. And so with that, I would like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Daniel C. Taylor. I'm actually going to read the bio that is in the back fold of his book right here so you guys can get an understanding of who he is. You might hear papers rustling. We actually use paper. Daniel C. Taylor is currently president of Future Generations University, having also started the global family of seven Future Generations organizations, which you can find at www.future.org. Earlier, he led the Mountain Institute, which is at mountain.org. 
He has his master's and doctoral degrees from Harvard University. In recognition of his conservation work, he was knighted Gorka Dakshin Bao III by the King of Nepal, made honorary professor of quantitative ecology by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and decorated with the Order of the Golden Ark by Prince Bernard of the Netherlands. <laughs> hey, weren't you a, an Eagle Scout? Yeah, I did. I, that's that's <laughs> well, where it ends for me. Yeah. But yes. <laughs> yeah, not too shabby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very CV. impressive person. He's, he's Absolutely. He's been a busy man. Yeah. So uh, with that, why don't we go to his interview, and we'll come back and visit you guys a little bit later with our final wrap-up on this series. Let's talk a little bit about your background. I did want to say that for our show, we get to go and look at different mysteries many, many, many over the course of each year. Every four to six weeks, we're coming to something new, and we're inhaling books on the mysteries. And we have a head of research. Her name's Tess Feifel, and we went to her and we said, hey, look, we're gonna, we want to cover the Yeti. What is the best source? What's the best book for us on this? And she came back and said, it's got to be Daniel C. Taylor's book, Yeti, The Ecology of a Mystery. And I was excited to get it, but I also have to say, generally, what's happening is I'm sitting down with books like yours, and I'm going through them and reading them and making notes and highlighting, and I've got a copy here that's all marked up with my notes (laughs) and stuff in it, (laughs) which I like that because I feel like I've understood it after that to a better extent. But honestly, some of these books that I get on mysteries that are led by the preeminent researcher on the mystery at hand they're very one-dimensional. I found your book a very compelling story. I loved the references to Kipling and just the whole nature of your background. You're a very fascinating person. I mean, you, you grew up. And, and I, this is the other thing I learned through the course of this from a friend of mine who takes yoga. It's not Himalaya. It's Himalaya. Yeah, it's Himalaya. If you tend it to the Sanskrit, yes. Okay. It's Himalaya. So you grew up in northern India in the Himalayas, or at least you lived there when you were a young man, right? I went. I lived there from when I was two to fourteen, and then I've been going back since. And my grandparents went out 105 years ago. My father was born in the jungle. So that was part of the colonial movement in India, right? Right. Okay. Right. And so you grew up in that environment. You're not necessarily visiting as so much as going home when you go there. Yeah, I mean, I've made at this point 45 field trips into Tibet, and you know the ones in Nepal expeditions are more than that, and the Indian ones also. I mean, I've been doing this ever since when I first went there was 1947. So it, it is home in a deeply way, and I've been the privileged to be often the first Westerner into whole valley systems. That is just super fascinating to me, and I feel like there's so much more to your book than just the idea of what the Yeti is and your exploration. And I think another thing that interested me about it was your approach to the research was so much more than just a scientific approach. What we found in the past, again, when we looked into other mysteries, there's all these camps about who believes X, Y, and Z, and a lot of times they're at odds with each other, and the the science approach is over here, and the more spiritual or mythological approach is in another camp, and they don't meet in the middle. But you seem to have, like you took a big picture of the overall idea of the Yeti. Can you talk a little bit about why that was how you came at this? When a person believes something, they believe it. And it's a total waste of time to tell them that they're wrong. And it's totally unproductive. Growing up in India, I mean, I was a Christian. And my childhood friends were Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims. And the stupidest thing in the world is for a person of one belief to tell a person of another belief that they're wrong. Right. And so if somebody believes in the Yeti, as an animation that walks across the snow and has big pendulous breasts that they have to fling over their shoulder, and that these female yetis are searching for children that they can take to their cave, the person believes that. Right. And it's totally useless and not informative. It's, in fact, a sign of ignorance to tell them that they are wrong. And so with the case of the yeti, it's a fabulous opportunity to understand that the world is seen in different directions. And by understanding the different directions that people are looking from, guess what? You understand more. Absolutely. And that's what I found in your book. That's why I really am. I'm hoping that our listeners all go out and pick it up, honestly, because it's eye-opening in terms of that approach. Well, getting to down to the Yeti itself and your first introduction to it, which you mentioned, you've been at this for 60 years now, which definitely makes you the preeminent researcher on it. I mean, your first exposure to it was the discovery of the Shipton photo. Is that correct? Yeah, it was on a front page of a newspaper in 1956 in India. And 
I grew up in with the jungle right out the back door. And I knew that footprints meant animals. Rain falling on the dirt doesn't make footprints. Right. You've got a real animal I mean, as soon as you have a footprint. Well, the question is, what made that footprint? Because as soon as you look at that footprint, and there's pictures in the book, but in the, the end of the book shows I discovered a footprint that nobody had actually seen or paid any attention to in the archives in the World Geographical Society that actually solves a lot of the mystery. But the footprint meant that we're talking about a real animal. And that, for an 11-year-old boy who's on the edge of the jungle, is very different from a goblin that he might be afraid of at night when he wakes up with a bad dream. Right. Because, as you said in the book, legends don't leave footprints. And legends don't leave footprints. And interestingly, angels don't leave footprints. And ghosts don't leave footprints. But when you see a footprint, you're talking something real. Did you feel like you were on a mission from that point? Or was it that pronounced? Or you just thought, okay, this is... You didn't sit when you were 11 years old and say, this is my life's goal is to figure out what made this footprint, or were you specifically that focused on it? No, absolutely not. I'm an 11-year-old boy. Right. And show me an 11-year-old boy. There are very few that are going to get on a life mission at age 11. This is true. I was in for adventure. And so those footprints were leading me on a trail of adventure and mystery. And there were a lot of animals in the jungle that I hadn't seen by that point in my time. King Cobra, for instance. I'd seen tigers and leopards. But I hadn't seen wild dogs, which are perhaps the most dangerous animal in the Indian jungle. And so, yeah, maybe this animal's out there along with wild dogs and king cobras. I mean, king cobras, I knew that if I was going to see one, I better be careful because they're 18 feet long and they're really poisonous. Right. You know, one thing I love about the holidays is all the great food that's in store. Yeah, me too, but it's not all in store. A lot of it you can have delivered right to your doorstep. Oh, I see what you did there. (laughs) And I can see where you're going with this too, Blue Apron. Yes, exactly, because some of the tastiest and most memorable meals you can make this holiday season could be recipes created by Blue Apron's team of professional chefs, all of which can be prepared in under 45 minutes. And all you have to do is follow the step-by-step instructions. And if you can do that, you're bound to have a winner for dinner each and every time. It really couldn't be more convenient because along with those easy-to-follow instructions, Blue Apron sends you every high-quality ingredient you'll need in just the right amounts with two, three, or four recipes each week and exactly on the day you want them delivered. And just listen to the featured meals for December. Baked tilapia and creamy kale with fregola sarda pasta. Sheet pan roasted pork with fall vegetables and creamy maple mustard. Chili butter steaks with lemon parmesan broccoli and potatoes and creamy tomato pasta with mushrooms and collard greens. I get the feeling you like reading off the names of artisanal menu selections. I do, but not as much as I like eating them. And here's a great deal so you can see for yourself why Blue Apron is the leading meal kit delivery service in the U.S. Blue Apron is treating Astonishing Legends listeners to their first three meals, a $30 value with your first order. If you visit blueapron.com slash astonishing. That's right. You got to use our special URL. So check out this week's menu and get your $30 off with free shipping at blueapron.com slash astonishing. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. I'm Ken, and this is Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. When you first visited the valley, it was is it Barron? Is that how you pronounce it? The Barron and Baroon. Aaron? Baroon. Baroon and Arun. When you went to those valleys and first started looking into the origin stories of the Yeti tales, initially, did you think you were looking for something solid or you were looking for something more folklorish, or were you separating the difference between what made the footprint and what the locals felt the Yeti was? Well, there was 27 years from 1956 until 1983 when I went into the Baroon. Uh-huh. So I'd been on 30, maybe 50, depends on what you want to call it, Yeti searching escapades in that period of time. And I'm a kid, I'm an adult, and so it's times I'm looking for a being, a monster that's yellow, a monster that's white, a monster that's brown. And my imagination runs with these things. I'm reading other people's accounts. So during that 27-year period, I cannot claim to being a devoted, single-focused scientist. Right. First of all, my training is not in science. I'm in development planning. 
my father was a scientist and many of my best friends were scientists and I deeply valued science. And so I was trying to follow the scientific method. The answer to your question is I went to the Barun Valley for two reasons. First of all, the most credible Yeti evidence other than the Shipton print was the evidence from Tom Slick's expeditions, a Texas millionaire. He had made three expeditions for looking for the Yeti. Big, giant things. One with 600 people, porters on it. Right. And then Cronin and McNeely's trip in 1971-72. And they all both had found really credible Yeti evidence. So that was one thing. That was the place to go based on prior expeditions. And then the second reason I went was that the king of Nepal told me that if the Yeti was anywhere, it was going to be in the Barun Valley. And when the king tells you something, <laughs> well, it's worth listening to. And you guys met in graduate school, is that correct? Yeah, we were both at Harvard together. Okay, and so you were friends. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's nice to have the king as a friend. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really interesting because when you talked about one of your meetings with him, about the nature of your ideas and having his helicopters at your disposal, and that allowed you to really broaden your search. And also, you were able to later in your journey as you were exploring conservation and, and planning, as you mentioned earlier, you were able to use his resources to convince other people of new ways to conserve the area in the in the Himalayas. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, once we found the Yeti, once we tranquilized the animal, once we were able with a tranquilized animal to do what nobody had done before, which was to explain the footprints with a known animal. Okay. Once we had done all that, the question comes, do I put on a Chewbacca suit and go around the world giving Yeti lectures, <laughs> and then halfway through the lecture, unzip the suit, Right. <laughs> and I can make five to $10,000 a lecture doing sure. that. Sure. <laughs> um, and I might be able to get on August radio programs like yours. Right, right. But is there any meaning in that? The only meaning is money well, and fame. Sure. And so... The question logically came, how can we protect the planet and the ecosystem? Because from my childhood, three decades earlier, I was watching before my eyes, animal numbers go down and jungles be cut. And so it wasn't really a question. The answer was in your, my face, which is the meaning is to try to do something about this habitat. And then as I did something about the habitat, there's even larger question, which is what is the mystery of the wild? Because even once I tell people what this animal is that I tranquilized and we put in the footprints, you'll be amazed at the end of the lecture after I've taken off the Chewbacca suit, how many people come up afterwards and say, but, 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 maybe there's another valley. Maybe there's a lost population of mountain gorillas that came over from Africa and they're hiding up, but, but, but. And I said, what is this call that's inside people that wants the Yeti to exist? So the answer to your question is not a simple one. No, it's complex. And honestly, with regard to that, I feel like, you know, the lost population topic, you covered that in your book, the number yeah. of creatures that would be required. I can't remember who it was that you spoke to in the book, the name of the person, but... John Craighead. Yes, Craighead. Cause he, he, he did he's, this for bears. Right. And so you guys spoke about, you know, how you would not be looking for just one, you'd be looking for a population, which should be easier to find as well. With regard to the tranquilizing, since you touched on that, of the Yeti, that was the Asiatic black bear that was in the King's Zoo, Right. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Right. You guys tranquilized it, and you were able to make a comparison between its feet and the Shipton footprint. Correct. And the Cronin McNeely footprint, and the Tambazi footprint, and the white footprint, all of which needed to be explained if you were going to definitively say we've explained all the Yeti evidence. But here's the important but. What is the Asiatic black bear? Now, science will put together a DNA sequence, and so they will say that answers it. But you know what, Scott? You've got a DNA sequence, and I've got a DNA sequence, and you can't tell me that Scott and Daniel are the same thing. Right. Or anybody that's listening to this program. And so the scientific answer of a DNA sequence does not answer the question about the mysteries. And that's what I'm trying to wrestle with in this book, Yeti. The ecology of a mystery. And let me just take this one step further. If you grow up in some habitat, let us just say it's 
urban Los Angeles. And I grow up in a different habitat. Let us say the Himalaya Mountains. And there's somebody else who's on this program, and she grew up in a different habitat, and it's Paris. Now, we are going to be similar in our DNA, but our outlook is going to be different, and our values. And so the bear, to come back to the bear, who's properly called, if we're talking about DNA, Ursus Arctis Tibetanus, the bear actually is going to be shaped by his or her habitat. And in that habitat shaping, some bears are big, some bears are little, and more importantly, bears differ over their lifespan. And this people keep misunderstanding. A adolescent boy or girl is very different from a 60-year-old boy or girl, man or woman. And so you get a very unusual behavior of Ursus Arctis Tibetanus when it's two years old. And because it cannot live on the ground, because its daddy will eat it, and it's too old for its mummy to protect it after one year, that Ursus Arctis Tibetanus develops an inner digit on its paw that looks like a thumb. And so all of a sudden, you've got a member of the Ursus family who looks like a member of the hominoid family. The answer is in the ecology of the mystery. And to just sort of say, oh, the Yeti is a piece of DNA, it misses the mystery. Sure. And it misses the answer. To me, you can see why I got kept on going for 60 years now, because it's really, really interesting stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it is fascinating. I wanted to ask you that question was something that when you guys found the nest, can you describe a little bit what the nest was like Well, for the juvenile? Yeah, yeah, it was really interesting. First of all, the first set of nests we found, there were four of them. And there's a picture of one of them in the book. And it was made, they were made out of bamboo. And so Imagine big stands of bamboo, clumps actually in this case, that particular species of bamboo grows in clumps. And so bamboo had been broken off at the same height. Now to break bamboo is hard when it's one inch in diameter. Sure. And to break a whole bunch of bamboo stalks at the same height and fold them over and size themselves, essentially to weave a nest, weave a map by breaking over these bamboo stalks, indicated one, a strong animal. The wind didn't do it. I have another story in the book about a bunch of bamboo that was broken over by wind and it almost killed me. And um, just I linked it there in the chapter immediately preceding, just sort of as a metaphor of nature making bending bamboo and then a beast bending bamboo. I just assumed the reader is going to make the parallel. Sure. But in this case, these nests were bent over stalks of bamboo at the same height. And what they did was they allowed whatever this beast was, because at the time we found them, we didn't know, to not have to be sitting on the snow. And the snow in that part of the Barun Valley is wet and cold. So it starts to feel a little bit like a human being making a home. Sure. See, and that's fascinating. And for our listeners, earlier when you mentioned the thumb, the reason that they had this thumb-like appendage was because they needed to be able to climb for safety. It was about survival. It was about right, right, to get up in the tree. Well, there's another reason, too, that I discuss in the book, but I'm trying not to get into too deeply into the ecology because most people get bored by that. The Barun Valley is exceptional I mean, in Himalayan ecosystems because there's essentially no grasses. The forest canopy is so complete that it cuts out this sun that would normally create the grasses. Okay, and so the vegetative stuff to eat in great numbers is high in trees. It's not on the ground level. It's not in bushes. It's not in berries. Okay? It's not to say there aren't any. But go to, up into the tree, oak trees, and find acorns, for instance. So the population that can climb the trees is going to be getting more food than the population that's down on the ground. So that among ground-living species, there's much more competition for food than there is among arboreal. Sure. And this is unusual because normally the number one food for all life are the grasses. And on top of the grasses live the herbivores. And on top of the herbivores, the carnivores. And we don't have that in that normal pyramid in the Barun Valley. When you were on several of your expeditions, your friend uh, Lindoop was there. Am I saying his name right? Yeah, yeah, you got it dressed right. Yeah, can you tell our listeners a little bit about Lindoop and what kind of person he was and what he did for you on your expeditions? 
Scott, you've asked me a question that makes me smile. <laughs> I was fascinated with him. So, <laughs> Lendup is a genius. Uh-huh. And in our human ancestry, we've had many geniuses in the jungle. People who can follow a trail that is not obvious to anybody else. People who have a sixth sense that goes beyond the fifth, five senses that most humans have. And Lendup is such a master hunter. And I was just in awe. The more I worked with this man, the more I was in awe of what he could see that I couldn't see. And I thought I had grown up in the jungle. And it's what must have been like to travel with the Apaches, for instance, in the American Southwest, who are able to see trails across the sands and through the, you know, Arizona and New Mexico that just totally beyond the ken. It's a lost skill and knowledge. And I have, throughout my life, been fascinated by tracking. I've got some passages in the book because I don't think you can understand the Yeti without looking at the trail. The Yeti is created by footprints and so that there's all sorts of layers of meaning there. And Lendup is the best I've ever worked with. And that was 18 months ago, I was back in the Baroon. Lendup is now an old man. I'm an old man. And we went back in the jungle together and we were just like two 15-year-olds playing. (laughs) You know, I loved how it was him that you first saw at the one expedition. He was up in the distance, just watching yeah. over you. That's how you got introduced yeah. to him, right? And, yeah, he, yeah. and he had the muzzle loader. Then when he came down into your campsite, he didn't have that and said he didn't have one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was very cagey. But then you also implied that locally, it seemed like he had staked you guys out as oh, yeah. territory to be your guide and yeah. that everyone else knew that he was going to be the guide and they should stay away. Yeah, they didn't want to cross the uh, Lendup. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. And then the other thing I like is that one of his quotes that you had him down as saying on page 46 of your book, I am many times in the jungle as a hunter. How can there be such an animal? I never see its sign in the jungle. What does it eat? How does it move? I have heard shock paw stories from people, but I have never seen any signs myself. Well, at that point, I should have just packed up and walked out to the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> You were saying that in some cases, obviously not with him, but in other cases that guides or people, they see somebody coming in like you that clearly has a little money to spend on an expedition, and maybe it behooves them to perpetuate the Yeti stories because it generates revenue for the locals to run these trips for you. Exactly. I mean, I think that I mentioned the Cronin McNeely example in 1972, where a local hunter said, oh, yes, we have Yetis in the forest. Right. And then it's like, let's go. How many people will you need? Like Tom Slick. I mean, they must have, everybody must have been talking about the five, 600 porters he had or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) It's a job, it's a job market. Right. But you also said a thing about Slick's evidence was that he was pretty quiet about the analysis of it after, because you indicated later in the book that you felt that maybe it wasn't mysterious enough or it didn't support the theories that he had put forward. So he didn't say a whole lot about the analysis of the evidence he brought back. Yeah, now, this is a very interesting point that relates to Yeti hunters, okay? We keep thinking about the Yeti, but it's important to think about the Yeti hunter. Now, Tom Slick got interested in the question for his own reasons. I won't go into those. But what he needed to do was to find the answer to the Yeti. He needed an answer, but he didn't need money, and he didn't need fame because he was a rich Texas oil man. So if he wasn't going to give the answer he needed to give for his personal reasons, he didn't give the answer. Even though he's sitting on evidence that I would love to have, and I've talked with members of his expeditions, and I quote some. Think of another Yeti hunter. We have Yeti hunters now, this group from the University of Buffalo, Brian Sykes from Oxford, who go out and do DNA analyses of Yeti. What do they need from the Yeti? They need publications to advance their scientific careers. Sure. Okay, and that's a different agenda. And what does a Himalayan resident need from the Yeti? Well, if you're a little boy who's 18, not a little boy, an adolescent who's guarding the sheep, and one of the sheep disappears, you need an explanation so you can tell the owner of the sheep what happened. So that's a different Yeti, okay? Sure. And if you're a mountaineer who's on an expedition to go climb Mount Everest and you don't succeed, well, come home with a Yeti story. Right. And that's another Yeti. And this goes back to the beginning point. All those are valid Yetis. They're valid. <laughs> they are real Yetis because the person found that Yeti. Yeah, that's a very good point. And it, you think that that also contributes to the idea, and I'm, I might not say this right as either, but of the Bun Manchi? Yeah. The Bun Manchi. Bun is forced. Manchi is man in Nepali. Okay. 
Hindi, it's bun, but it's basically the same word. And that's a, that's a, the wild man. Yes, a wild man. It's a man of the forest. It's the same event that presumably Daniel Boone claims he shot in the mid 19th century. Um, I mean, mid 18th century. I had not heard that yeah. until I read it in your book. <laughs> Daniel Boone. Well, he claims he shot one. Okay. He never brought forth the, the fur, so whatever. But the point is that there are legends in almost every traditional society in the world of animations, human-like animations that live in the forest or the jungle. Sure. The Russians have them, the Americans have them, everybody, the Africans have them, and so on and so forth. And this is a very important link, I believe, that connects us as a domesticated species with our other fellows on this planet who are wild species. We need this missing link. We need this connection. And the Yeti is one of the greatest of all these icons or avatars or whatever you want to call them. Another passage that I enjoyed in the book was the interesting, it was one of your meetings with the king. You were saying to him that, you know, this is what I'm trying to explore. And I'm looking for this bear that at the time you thought might be a new species of bear that was previously right. unknown to science. And you guys had a discussion about because the king was interested in getting to the bottom of it, but it seemed like you both needed to realize, or you were concerned with him making sure that he realized you didn't want to take away the magic of what the Yeti was from the kingdom of Nepal. Absolutely. I mean, you know, the Yeti brings tourists by the hundreds, if not the thousands. Specifically, people go to Nepal to look for the Yeti, and then they go into the bazaar and they buy T-shirts that have the Tin Tin Yeti on them from the Tin Tin books. They go and have a drink at the Yak and Yeti bar. They buy refrigerator magnets of the Yeti. The Yeti is good business. There's Yeti beer. There's Yeti whiskey. In fact, there's Yeti beer now sold in Denver, Colorado. Sure. And there's a Yeti bike company that I think is based in Colorado. And then there's the yeah, Yeti coolers. Yeah, forget those Yeti coolers. They got to chill out a bit. <laughs> So in the course of the investigation, and in terms of all the locals that you talked to in various areas, one of the ideas that became clear was that they were describing what they thought were two different types of bears. This large ground bear that if you came across a, a dead one would take five men to carry, and then the tree bear that if you came across a deceased one, it would only take two men to carry. And so that puts you on this journey of trying to identify possibly a different species for this tree bear, right? And if I understand correctly. Right, Scott, first of all, you've read my book carefully. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, as an author who's wrestled over these sentences, it's nice to hear somebody Quoting them back to you. Oh, um, well, I really, I really enjoyed it. I couldn't put it down. Honestly, it was very interesting well, to me. Some people like Bill McKibben and Wade Davis, who are literary masters, have said equally nice things about it, and I really appreciate it. But this is very interesting. We are conditioned. We are brainwashed in the West, and we must acknowledge that we are brainwashed by our media and everything else to always think of animals as defined by their DNA. But if you don't have that brainwashing, and you think of animals as defined by behavior, which is what traditional peoples do, all of a sudden the taxonomy, it changes radically. Because instead of having dogs, you've got aggressive dogs, you've got cute dogs, you've got ugly dogs, you've got dogs that are defined by a different norm than the dog's chromosomes. and. If you are a dog owner, you really care more about the dog's behavior. And most people who I think are listening to this would say, I care more about my dog's behavior than I do actually about his genes, unless you're worried about the dog winning a prize at the Westminster Kennel Club. <laughs> and so the behavior is what's important to people, and DNA is what's important to scientists. This is actually a big deal, I think. If you're a villager, living on the edge of the jungle in the Himalaya mountains, what you really care about is whether the animals that are in the jungle that are coming out of the jungle are going to eat your crops. Right. Because if their behavior is one that eats your crops, then you're not going to have food to feed your kids. That's what's important. Not what the animal is, but what the animal does. Sure. If the behavior of the animal is to kill you, then you're worried about that. It's not your food, it's your, it's your own life. And so my point in trying to say what I mean by the ecology of the mystery is let's get into these great 
questions that truly affect our lives about the wild, not worry about a very small issue comparatively, which is the scientific question. Now, I'm not dismissing the scientific question, mind you. The book's full of science, but it has to be cast in the context of life. Absolutely. Hey there. Yeah, you, the listener. Still don't have anybody special to share the upcoming holidays with? Well, there's still time to find that right person to make it all special and memorable because eHarmony is here to help. As soon as you fill out your profile and post it, eHarmony will start to send you compatible matches to your personal page right away. And you can get email notifications of suitable people based on your preferences sent to you every day. And these matches aren't just shallow, random hookup suggestions based on swiping pictures. There are plenty of other sites for that. That's not what eHarmony is. These matches are people looking for lasting and meaningful relationships, just like you. You know they're going to be compatible with you because eHarmony uses years and years of science, data, and psychological research to send you the right matches. Think of it as a filter that's going to save you so much time by not wasting outings with the wrong people. People who aren't starting off thinking and feeling the way you do. Simply put, eHarmony brings compatible people together. And they've already helped over a million people find their perfect match. And right now, our listeners can get a free month with eHarmony when they sign up for a three-month subscription. Just enter our code LEGENDS at checkout. Stop waiting and start your journey to a satisfying, meaningful relationship. It can be fun to play around with online dating apps, but when you're ready to fall in love with someone and have a meaningful relationship, there's one app that's built to bring you real love, eHarmony. Come see how eHarmony can change your life. Go to eHarmony.com and get started. Enter our code LEGENDS at checkout. Uh, So, Forrest, can I see who you're going to be spending New Year's Eve with? And now, back to the show. This is Kirby in Maryland, and when I'm not avoiding goat men and snallygasters, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Now, back to the show. I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier I wanted to touch on because I thought this particularly stood out to me as well. You mentioned the sixth sense, specifically when you were talking about Lindoop, but also in that story that you told about the tigress, the man-eating tigress. Right. You mentioned, I believe it was you personally that experienced something. You knew that something was happening before there was necessarily any any evidence of it. And you talk a little bit about that sixth sense and specifically the absence of the kinds of things that you might normally listen for, like you being in tune with the jungle. I'm sure that you maybe even subconsciously or maybe consciously, depending on your level of experience, you know when there's warning calls coming from birds or other animals in the area. But you were saying that you don't always hear that, but you still have this feeling. What do you think that is? Where do you think that comes from? I don't know. And I would like to know more about this. I get it at times when I'm in the jungle or in the high mountains. One time, for instance, I had a sense that I really had to get out of where I was standing. I was at a fairly high altitude, about 17,000 feet, and I was really tired. I had a pack on, and I pushed really hard, and I got away from where I was standing. And 30 seconds later, some rocks came down to where I was had been standing. Oh, jeez. Right. Okay. That just threw my, I was going to say, what if it's pheromones? But rocks don't have pheromones. (laughs) No, no. I would have been pancaked. Okay. Oh my God. And Lindoop has a boulder in front of his house, doesn't he? Was that him? Exactly. Yeah. You mentioned the Tigris. Yes. My grandfather went to India in 1914. There was a lot more jungle then. He was a master hunter. He's particularly good with leopards. Now, he had had experience that I mentioned in the book about the man-eating tigress that he and my father and my uncle were out and eventually shot it. That story, if you can want it, it's in the book. But when I was 16, he decided he needed to teach me a little bit more about the jungle. And so we went up in a tree and we, you know, go spend the night in the tree. And we remind you, we're talking about the 1960 was when this was. And we dealt with tigers in different ways then than we do now. And so we tied in a goat up underneath the tree. And the goat was bleeding. And so the idea was that the goat would call the tiger and we would see the tiger. And he would teach me about all things related to tiger as part of my education. He said, now go to sleep. And I said, well, Grandpa, we're up in the tree because I'm supposed to look at a tiger. And this is the tiger's coming. The goat's going to be there. I mean, you know, I was 16. I was pumped. (laughs) Well, by midnight, I was sleepy. And he said, just go to sleep. And he wakes me up at about 4 o'clock in the morning. He says, the tiger's coming. And I said, how do you know? He says, the tiger's coming. And 15 minutes later, the tiger came. And he had not heard anything 
he said, he had been asleep too. He woke up because he knew the tiger was coming. And just as the tiger came down the trail, the goat was by that point it was awake and was bleeding and so on and so forth. And so grandpa coughed in the tree and that may drove the tiger away and saved the goat's life. Okay, the point is something had woken grandpa up. Something had told me to move before those rocks came down and pancaked me. I give a story in the book about Jim Corbett, the greatest hunter of the Indian jungles, and how he had the sixth sense. Your question to me was, what's going on? My answer back to you is, I don't know. But you've experienced it. But I stand in awe in front of this the way I do in front of the Lord Almighty, because maybe it's one and the same. Sure. Okay. Let me just, I'm concerned for your time. I'm going to strike it, but I did want to talk about leaving the suitcase on 81 in the Shenandoah Valley. (laughs) (laughs) Because I felt so bad for you. You can summarize that story in your own words. Okay, let me just ask you one question about it. Because you had said specifically what I thought really had laid bare, and I felt crushed for you when you said you felt like you had lost your credibility at that point because it, the skulls were in the suitcase, you left it on the side of the road, and then it was gone. But just how you felt like, well, here I am, another guy exploring this thing, and it, it, the one bit of evidence I have from this work, I've just left it on the side of the highway. And it's interesting to me because there's so many stories that me and my co-host have encountered where evidence has gone missing. I mean, even with Amelia Earhart, her bones were supposedly on this island called Nicomororo, and they were measured, right. and they said they were hers, and they vanished. And every story has it. These things have vanished. And you think, how could that possibly happen? But your story, what happened to you, framed it so well. I mean, were you, like, completely deflated with that, or how did you feel about it? Well, it's actually a very important question for two reasons. First of all, for, for human integrity. And secondly, for science. And there are different answers at those two levels. Because unless you can provide evidence, you're a storyteller. And there's nothing wrong with storytelling. That's what we are. (laughs) Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with it. But don't mistake storytelling for truth. Yes. Unless it's a story like a parable in the Bible that is speaking of an eternal truth. But if it's a historical truth or a scientific truth, You need evidence that can be objectively verified by somebody who comes after you. Right. And that is actually a very big deal. And people now go to war over what they believe to be truths. This goes back to our earlier question about beliefs. And you need to understand, I need to, as for my personal integrity, to be always making that connection. Now, the next question that follows from this is, what was I planning to do when I lost the suitcase? Yes. Well, I would have scraped together some nickels and gone back to the Himalaya and gone and picked up some new bear skulls and presented them as the evidence because they were the same as the evidence had been lost. What I had lost was the photographs. But I could still recover the bear evidence and I could still have substance to put behind my thesis. Sure. See, everything came back and it was a heck of a roller coaster ride, as described in the book. I think that one of the most fascinating parts about your book and the journey that you went on was that along the way, because of your expertise, you developed some new ideas for conservationism, uh, specifically for the Himalayan region. And it, yep. it's, it seemed like the king actually put you to that task, too, because you had mentioned in one meeting, he said, I want you to help me protect my country. And right. So can you talk a little bit about how that evolved? And maybe I think what is really super fascinating is the meeting in uh, the uh, Saldima Meadows. Right. What that led to and the end result of that, and also the courses that you offered teaching others how to conserve land for the future. Thank you, Scott. Let me start with the courses, because I'm president of Future Generations University. And one of the five specializations we offer, which is a master's degree in applied community change, is in ecosystem resilience and conservation, so that people can learn how to be professionals in conservation. And so if you want more, it's at www.future.edu. And what's important about this is that the conservation method that those courses teach is, in fact, a different way of looking at nature or dealing with nature from the way we're accustomed to which is that instead of setting nature apart and protecting the wild in pockets, which we call national parks usually, instead of doing that, we need to bring the national park mentality into wherever we live, whether it's 
New York City or whether it's, you know, Kampala, Uganda. We need to bring nature into our lives, not to set nature apart from our lives. Now, how we do that is by changing our behaviors, not by taking people and sending them like we did with Yellowstone. Take all the people out of it. Take the Native Americans out. Take all the settlers out. And then we have created a national park. We need to do a new type of synthesis of people living together with nature. And when we do this, we can take care of the whole planet, not just 10%, which is what many conservationists are hoping to do. Now, how do we get there? Well, by the early 1980s, it was very evident that the Yellowstone and the American National Park model was deeply flawed. And in one word, it's flawed because it's too expensive. So even today, though most Americans love their national parks, we're defunding them. And if we defund them, we're necessarily going to kill them. So we need a new conservation model that allows us to do conservation at larger scale, ideally planet wide, and be able to afford it. And the only answer to that is by making all people on the planet conservationists where everything everybody does is protecting that which causes the quality of our human life. And that's what we teach in the master's degree, but I wanted to set this up in Nepal, which at that time had already protected about 10% of its land, and they were trying to protect more, as the king was instructing me, because the king knew that his country was one of the most special places on the planet. And so we said, we're going to come up with a new idea. And so instead of sitting with a bunch of scientists in a hotel room or the Nepal Academy, we put everybody on a helicopter and we took them into the Saldima Meadows in the middle of the Barun Valley at the foot of the fifth highest mountain in the world, Makalu. And we met in bamboo huts and there was the editors of the National Geographic and there was the president of the Dodge Foundation, but more importantly, there were local villagers sitting there. And we talked together with the uncle of the king presiding. And we came up with a new model, which is people working with professionals, working with the government, and that became the model of participatory conservation that we created with Makalu Baru National Park. The World Wildlife Fund grabbed this idea, and they implemented it in the Annapurna Conservation Area further west in Nepal. And then other places across the Himalaya have now implemented it. But what I was doing then was that, but for a variety of reasons, I was aware that massive, wonderful areas existed in Tibet. And Tibet at that time was closed. We're talking about the early 1980s. My grandfather had actually been the first American to go into Tibet in 1927, went to a mountain called Mount Kailai. But Tibet was, under the Chinese, closed. And I arranged, in a story that's described in the book, to show some distinguished leaders of China what the land looked like on the Chinese Tibetan side of Mount Everest. And then they invited me to go to Tibet, where I had the privilege of then meeting the governor of Tibet and introduce this idea of people-based conservation. And the governor of Tibet was a chap by the name of Hu Jintao. Now, Hu Jintao, 20 years later, becomes president of China. And so the, my work in China ultimately leads to starting the Green Long March, which is a youth movement with 80 Chinese universities and becomes the, we ran it for four years until we shut it down, the largest youth environmental movement in China. But the point is that conservation is fundamentally not policing, it's participation of people working together to change their behaviors. And this is a different conservation approach than the one of legalization and lawsuits and restrictions which is the more normative way that we look at it. And so that's, as I say, we teach it in our master's degree in, uh, at uh, Applied Community Change at www.future.edu. If people want to learn more, I've written about it in other books that are scholarly books. Let me just point anybody who is interested to Empowerment on an Unstable Planet, which is a book that's published by Oxford University Press, or a second book that I've written called Just and Lasting Change, which is published by Johns Hopkins. And these have a number of case studies that are very readable about how to do this changing of our behaviors. That, to my mind, is, is the vision that which we need to get to for all of humanity. And the Yeti got me there. Isn't that wonderful? It that is something wonderful. something that doesn't exist got us to this place? 
<laughs> it really, it really is. And I think it's a, a, the most fascinating part of your journey, really. And the amount of land that wound up being protected following your model, I mean, China alone put aside an area larger than Taiwan, I believe. Well, that was the Mount Everest project, it was three times the size of Yellowstone, larger than Taiwan. But we have another park, Four Great Rivers, it's the size of Washington State, 40 million acres. Okay. We've got 17 national parks now in Tibet. 54% of Tibet is protected. And Tibet's the size of Western Europe. Right. And it's, I also thought it was fascinating how you establish zones for right. different types of activities. Right. It, it seems right. like a brilliant idea to me, and I see a lot about what you're saying. I lived in New York for nine years myself, so it's interesting the idea of what you're talking about, like bringing things together. It's, uh, But it's also critical. I totally believe that it is, right. and I think what you're doing is, uh, I think it's really important work. I would like to salute all New Yorkers. <laughs> oh, yeah? I think New York, in the Adirondack State Park, yes, it's got the finest example of conservation in the United States, bar none. It also is three times the size of Yellowstone. Sure. And it's run for one-tenth the cost. One-tenth. Yeah, that is impressive. And New York City is the greenest city, perhaps, or at least one of the three greenest cities in the United States. And the way that they've restored parklands, they're digging up the sidewalks and planting trees. We talk about this in detail in my book empowerment on an unstable planet. There's a lot of great conservation that's possible when people get to work and they stop thinking it's the job of somebody else or the government. It's the job of all of us. I couldn't agree more. And I loved New York City. I loved living there and rode my bike everywhere I went, which I can't <laughs> quite seem to pull off in Los Angeles. So... <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's a great. And before we go, let me right. ask you this. In light of the, you know, the hard, the scientific part of it, the Shipton footprint, what is your official position on what made that footprint, just for our listeners? That's an easy thing. It was probably a mother, Ursus Arctis Tibetanus, who was walking with two cubs over the Minlung Glacier. The bear went over the mountain to see what it could see. In this particular case, the mother was trying to take her two babies for some more food on the other side of the pass. And I am 100% certain that it is Ursus Arctis Tibetanus because I have matched those footprints with paw prints of Ursus Arctis Tibetanus with a plaster cast. And there's a picture of it in the book. That was the bear that you tranquilized in the King Zoo. Right, right. And the same species and so on and so forth. So I'm 100% sure of that. Now, what was also interesting about that was in the course of this, I had to get permission from the Royal Geographical Society in England to use that print, publish it. And they wrote back a letter and said, Dr. Taylor, uh, which of the Shipton prints do you want to use? And I saw this email and I said, uh, there's only one. I want to use that one. They said, no, there are two. So we have emails going back and forth. And I said, would you please send me the second one? And they sent me a second print. Well, they had just in the prior year digitized all their old archives, and they had found a second photograph. And I immediately sent it to my the second photograph to my friend Bob Fleming, who's referenced in the book, the finest natural historian for the Himalaya, I believe. And I sent it to three or four other people, and I said, who are Yeti followers? I said, "Have you ever seen this footprint?" And he said, "No, I've never seen that footprint." Of course, we all recognized that it was the quote the Shipton print, but it was a different Shipton print. It was taken at a little bit larger wide angle. So you saw more detail than you saw in the iconic one. Shipton snapped a second print. And for reasons that they obviously used the most mysterious print in 1951 and every time since then. But this other print has sat there in the archives of the Royal Geographical Society. And with that, I'm able to make an explanation, as I do in the book, that it confirms, because there's a lot more evidence and material in that print, that the maker is Ursus Arctis Tibetanus. Now, the other thing to note is that when this agenda began, we thought the Asiatic black bear was Selenarctis Tibetanus, but DNA evidence has showed us that it's Ursus Arctis. Ursus Arctis Americanus is the American black bear. Ursus Arctis Horribilis is the grizzly bear. So the grizzly bear can have sex with the yeti, and we would really have an abominable snowman then. 
Wow. And that's fascinating. And the other thing about that footprint that I think a lot of people don't realize, the Shipton photo, is that it's two prints in one place, right? Yeah. Because the bears frequently step in their own footprints as they walk. Yeah, exactly. I described that in the book. One of the things that hit me in about after I had made the bear explanation and I sort of kicked myself was I all of a sudden was going through all my notes, which I they're considerable. And I realized that every Yeti print is going uphill. Yes. And I put the pen down on my desk and I said, ah, the mountain is making the animal. Because when they go uphill, the prints are different. And then also in the case of the iconic Shipton print, right. the front paw came down with less weight on it. And that's why you didn't see claw right. marks. Exactly. And when they go uphill, the overprint of the hind paw on the front paw gets elongated because it's a little more work to lift up that heavy back foot right. and overprint perfectly, which is what a bear, like your house cat back home, Scott, when it runs around the room, it puts its hind paws on top of its forepaws. But if your house cat's going uphill, that hind paw will fall back a little bit, elongating the print. Oh, that's one of those moments. That's the aha moment. How is this not a movie? Have you not been called? This hasn't been optioned no, yet? I've not been called. I have a couple of friends who are produce movies, and uh, maybe one day they may call me, but usually they say, can I go out into the mountains and go hiking with you? Right. <laughs> Instead of let's make it a movie. Well, I really appreciate your time today. I guess my last question for you is, what is the Yeti to you? The Yeti to me is the symbol of the missing link between a domesticated human and the original human. Okay, the Yeti is our connection with the wild. And we have to embrace the wild in our domesticated life or we will lose our humanity. The point is this. We as people were not made to live in apartments. When it rains, we were given the best Gore-Tex suit ever, which is our skin. And to go out and experience the rain coming on us, to feel the cold, to feel the heat, is actually the way that we touch the eternal. And this is a, one of the most beautiful things. It's like making love. I mean, this is the touching of the eternal. But most people these days are viewing the wild as something to be watched on a glass screen. And what they want to see on the screen is animals having sex or mothers nursing their babies. And this tangibility of connection and being part of and one with the wild is a lot more exciting to me, at least, and I've tried to show this in the idea of the ecology of a mystery, that to me is much more exciting than watching animals having sex on TV. <laughs> and what's your position about some of the, of the spiritual legends, like among the Sherpas and the different cultures that have their own different ideas about it? Well, I think it's very much the same as the spiritual meaning that we see in the um, Christmas story in Christianity, or the creation story in Judaism. These are all expressions of ultimate truth. They're not fables. They're expressions of ultimate truth. And so when you talk to a Sherpa about the Yeti, before Westerners made the Yeti into this great mystery that they can make money off of, they are seeing this as an intermediary, as an avatar with the wild and with nature. It's a human representation that is halfway there and halfway here. And this is very similar to the representations that we have out of Greek literature and mythology. And then why should we say that the Sherpa's Yeti is any different from the centaur, okay, out of the Greek mythology? Or why should we say it's any different than the angel that Gabriel that informed Muhammad? These are all true. They're not false. It's just how we understand them as carrying messages, because they're all messengers to us. And the Yeti, very to me, as I try to say in the book, is a messenger from the wild to tell us about the opportunity we have in the Anthropocene, which is the restructuring of the wild that the human species has made. All right. Thank you so much for your time. This has been a really wonderful interview, and I know our listeners are going to love it. I really appreciate it. 
I look forward to it. You must say, I do a lot of interviews, Scott. You've given me one of the more satisfying ones. I want to thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you. I'm flattered. I was honestly uh, quite nervous about speaking to you, so I really went out of my way to, to make sure I was well-informed. I will say this. You did a much better job than the BBC or the CBC. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. Maybe there's a future for me yeah. if the podcast doesn't work out. But <laughs> Good luck, buddy. Right. Thank you very much. Take care. Right All right. Bye-bye. Bye. It's time for another new lecture series over at The Great Courses Plus. And oh man, am I really excited about this one. Decoding the Secrets of Egyptian Hieroglyphs. Famed Egyptologist Professor Bob Breyer says, by the end of the course, you'll pretty much understand how the language works, be able to translate some rather complex sentences from real texts, and when you go to museums that have Egyptian collections, you'll have a much better understanding of what you're looking at. I cannot wait to dive in. And learning how to read them is not as hard as you think. So here's the first thing I learned from this series, and something everyone should know. The correct term for the symbols, you know, the birds, feet, gods, and boats, <laughs> is it's hieroglyphs, not hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphic is the adjectival form of the word. We'll learn a hieroglyphic script, but the symbols that make up the script are called hieroglyphs. That just saved us so many apologetic emails to write. Well, we'll all hopefully be enjoying a little downtime over the holidays, so why not spend it learning about something you've always wanted to, like an area of history you've always been interested in, or a scientific idea, or learning how to draw or cook. And there's going to be so many opportunities to learn with all the holiday travel we're going to be doing. Watch the videos on your mobile device while on a plane trip, or listen to the audio on that long car ride to the relatives. It's something the whole family can enjoy. And right now is the perfect time to start enjoying The Great Courses Plus, because they're giving our listeners an entire month of unlimited access to all of their courses for free. But you need to sign up with our special URL. Start your free month today. Sign up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Remember, that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Hello, fellow listeners of Astonishing Legends. I'm Jordan, and like many of you, I'm a huge fan of Scott and Forrest's. In fact, they were a large part of the inspiration behind my own podcast, which covers topics similar to theirs, but the ones I cover are all set in Canada. I wanted to use this message as an opportunity to introduce myself and to invite you to check out my show. Since 2015, I've been covering true crime, mysteries, and a variety of weird and wonderful stories on the Nighttime Podcast. Listeners of Astonishing Legends may be interested in my recent two-part series covering Canada's, if not the world's most compelling and best documented poltergeist case. That episode is called Esther Cox and the Great Amherst Mystery. Or if you prefer stories that don't require a mind as open to paranormal concepts, you may be into the ongoing series my show is best known for, the still unexplained disappearance of then 26-year-old Emma Filipov. My coverage of Emma's story is unique as I've partnered with her mother and many of her close friends to provide a detailed telling of the events that led up to Emma's troubling disappearance. All 50-plus episodes of my show can be found wherever you get your podcasts. So please take a moment and subscribe now to the Nighttime Podcast. Now let's get back to Astonishing Legends. You know, I think no other article or interview or piece of video I think sums up the entire breadth of what the Yeti means than that interview right there. And that's what I really enjoyed about talking to him because, you know, a lot of times when we come to a subject and we get into a book on the subject and the person has a, not necessarily a radically locked down point of view, but a lot of times a point of view that doesn't stray. Yeah. In some cases, there's even animosity towards any opposing points of view. Often? Actually, often. Yeah, <laughs> often's a good word there. I mean, we and we found that with people who have different theories about Amelia Earhart, Oak Island, sure, sure. Um, all kinds of things. Yeah. But the thing that I found really refreshing about Professor Taylor's book was the open-mindedness and the willingness to embrace every angle of this story right. and, and, and of the idea of the Yeti. Zero mission to debunk anything. Yeah. He did not go on a mission to take anything away from anyone. Well, and, like, yeah, like all the articles, and, you know, I get it. It's an editor somewhere. I'm getting at all these uh, news articles that we saw, especially with the DNA findings that have been coming up very recently, as close as, like, uh, the 27th, 28th of November here. Yeah. Where it says, science solves the mystery of the Yeti. 
Right. That was repeated so often. It's like, again, mystery solved, because that's what we in the Western world want. And I keep saying Western world, I know, but it's it's just, I can't think of anything else. But it's the idea that we need to have this solved because we can't have some kind of strange, weirdo, hairy man running around. We and need we, cognitive closure. We need cognitive closure. <laughs> this must be explained. Yeah. Whereas I believe the other culture is like, no, we, we kind of have our own ideas. We're fine with that. Yeah. We don't exactly. need to define this by no, DNA I'm saying sequencing. exactly like you all <laughs> you the time. To, you have to be really exaggerated. Exactly. Oh, there you go. Very nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the point, though, is that I think what you see in ours culture now, it's, it's clickbait. It's come take a look at this. Here are the results. And as he pointed out, it's like, well, you solved what the mystery of that piece of hair was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, that piece of hair that you found on a tree. You yeah. didn't even see what the animal it came from. Here's a really old dusty dookie, and you know where it came from, this animal. Yeah. Uh, and that's great. I totally believe that. I can't, nobody can argue with that. It, well, aside from the earlier DNA results uh, in 2013 by the Sykes team, Professor Sykes, it, nothing against him. What I'm saying is that, you know, mistakes can be made, but he's in the ballpark. Yeah. He's in the ballpark. And so that's science. And somebody will come along, and if they don't think that that's accurate, they'll retest it and find the answer. So we've come to an answer, which is, I believe, infallible, and gives you an answer for that very specific question of what is this piece of bone here, or the fur, or leather, or whatever it is. Or in Professor Taylor's case, what made that footprint? Right. And again, that's uh, he didn't DNA sequence the footprint, but he did a lot of research and study on it, and I'm convinced that's what it is, that made that footprint. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I did want to talk a little bit more about the suitcase story. Oh, yes, please. Let's tell her. It it's... really just struck a chord with me, because yeah. another thing that we've encountered when we read about all these mysteries, and, and we've mentioned even in this series about evidence goes missing, or it's misplaced, or something sits in a desk for 30 years, or in the case of Kincaid's cave, if you believe that's real, the entire cave yeah. has disappeared at the Smithsonian. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything, everything, everything that, that was, was in it, it yeah, and, that's and what it's I mean. been sealed up. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting, because his whole life's work had culminated at a certain stage in it. This was some time ago. In the collection of skulls and bear paws, as he yeah. was trying to get to the bottom of this footprint. And his theory was that there was a new species of Asiatic black bear, which it wound up being, I'm not sure I'm using the right scientific name for it. We'll refer to his book for that there. I'm not even going to pretend to make sure I got that yeah. right. Yeah. But that there was a new species of it, and that he needed to prove that, and that it was known to the locals, but unknown to science. Right. Which it's very interesting because he had a meeting with the king in Nepal who was he was friends with, and the king said, you mean the villagers know something science does not? He was very into that. <laughs> he sure. Yeah. And uh, so he's gathering up these skulls, and he's going to see the curator, not at the Smithsonian. I, unfortunately, I can't remember which museum. And the curator says, yeah, well, you've got a big skull and a small skull. Could be diet, could be juvenile. You know, I, we can't say that this right. is a new species. Because right. what he was trying to show is that there was some bear running around that had a toe sticking out, yeah. like a digit, and that it was almost like a primate-looking foot. Right. And he did eventually come to a conclusion, but before, when he first went with his skulls to get proof or to say, can you surmise something from this? They said, no, we need more. And he came back and he had more. And then he was riding with his young child on, I believe it's Interstate 81 through the Shenandoah Valley, which I have driven many times between the Northeast and North Carolina, actually. It's because it's a, a way to avoid D.C. and the traffic on the East right, Coast. Right, right, right. Beautiful yeah. drive. Yeah. Unbelievably beautiful valley. But not at this moment for him, because his child was screaming, pulls over. I don't know if he's changing a diaper or something. He doesn't really get that specific. (laughs) But in the course of pulling over, his suitcase with all the evidence comes out of the car for whatever reason. And when he gets done dealing with, I believe it was his son, he drives away and leaves it on the side of the highway. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is the culmination of his work up until this point. You know, his work on the Yeti anyway. Yes. I mean, he's doing lots of other things. Sure. You know, working in conservation as well. But his point is that at that point, all his credibility had gone out the window, and he's just another crazy guy talking about something that doesn't exist. Exactly. And yeah. what little bit of hard proof he had, he left on the side of the road. Right. And that chapter was very poignant for me because he was devastated by it. And then I suddenly came to understand for the first time how somebody who's so well-educated and diligent and, you know, part of his own process and and pursuing all this can make a mistake like that, and it undermines everything you've been doing. So he calls all the local newspapers in the Valley. This is a... This is in the area of uh, West Virginia and south of West Virginia. He's calling all the police stations and newspapers, and he's putting out a reward and saying, please, I need to find this suitcase. 
Weeks go by, even months, I believe. And eventually he calls, I guess his police station and the chief or whoever answers the phone says, this guy called, he's got it, but he's real nervous. And apparently the guy was just real nervous about the suitcase and thought maybe something illegal was in it and didn't want to leave his name <laughs> well, and everything. And so there it, are it, skulls in it. Yeah. yeah so it yeah. culminated in Professor Taylor having to go meet him like at a dark gas station oh, in dear. the dark. And he waited for like an hour or something. The guy didn't show. And finally this pickup truck showed up and he traded it for $250 cash and got it back. So yeah. it's a great story. But that story is just one of many in the book that are, you know, semi-Yeti related, but still super interesting. And yeah. I highly recommend the book if you're looking for an interesting read and you found this series intriguing. It was really just a, a pleasure speaking to him about everything. You know, not to undermine anything that he did, because I have no intention of doing that. All his conclusions are accurate, and I think what he's done for conservation is amazing as well. But the parts of the Yeti that I think he would agree are still out there, the myth, the lore, what it means to all the different cultures, that is still there. And there are still many anecdotes that we shared with you guys that kind of defy the bear explanation. It doesn't have to do with interfering with the bear and the Shipton footprint. As far as I'm concerned, that's mystery solved. It really is. Yeah, yeah, he, he I agree. He's done the yeah. work. Couldn't agree more sure. with him about that. That footprint that is famously associated with the Yeti that everyone's going to be Googling and looking at for years to come and thinking, what is that? Yeah. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, Professor Taylor has shown what that is. Right. But the question still remains, uh, what about these anecdotes where people saw something different or they believe in something ethereal that, who knows, may not even touch the ground or leave a footprint? Yeah, so there's an interesting clip of an interview that is embedded in the National Geographic article on Dr. Taylor that features Jerry Moffat. He's a adventurer, mountaineer, I believe, a river guide in the area, and he's listed here as a first ascent filmmaker. I think that's a group that preserves and, and does adventure tours up there, but kind of an expert in the area. And he interviews a Sherpa family. So that's the clip that I saw. Now, I wasn't able to find the entire documentary or it's not available or it aired a while and it's no longer available. But this clip was very interesting because he interviews a Sherpa guide and, and his family, like the uncle is there and the two little kids are too shy to talk. <laughs> but it's interesting because through the nephew, who's the interpreter, he gives you a summation of the basic Sherpa belief about the Yeti. And I thought there were some interesting points here. So one thing that was uh, mentioned in the clip here by Jerry Moffat is that the Sherpa have lived there in the area for 500 years. And then he interviews, I think the translator's name is Dawa. So it's Dawa's family and his uncle Pemba. And he basically just asked them, you know, hey, can you give us some bullet points on what the legend is? What do you folks believe? And so here are some highlights to kind of the legend as they believe it. Just hearing the noise or roar of a Yeti can cause you harm. The Yeti can very quickly manifest itself and then disappear again, as we were talking about earlier. The Yeti is also just more than a natural creature. It's also a bit of a supernatural creature, as what we said before as well. There are mystical properties to it. Now, here's an anecdote that I thought was great because the grandfather of the translator, he's kind of a younger guy, was talking about his grandfather visiting the United States for the first time. So back in 1961, my grandfather went to the United States and he went to the Harlem Zoo. And when he saw the gorilla, he got really excited and said, that's a Yeti, that's a Yeti. Well, years later, people would come up to him with pictures of a bear, for example, like a picture of a brown bear, which is what a lot of people think a Yeti is. Now, this is the translator saying this. I'm just repeating this. And the grandfather would say, I know what a bear is, but that's not a Yeti. A Yeti is like this. And he would point specifically to a picture of a gorilla. So the interpreter personally believes, and his family believes, that the Yeti is more of an ape-like creature than a bear-like creature. Oh, that's interesting. And that is their belief. And the point that I love here is that the guy goes, yeah, I know what a bear is. Right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I've seen bears. That's not what I saw. And of course, people, even in our own Facebook group, make fun of me for this, but it is, don't tell me what I saw. Yeah. And just think how insulting that is. It's like, sure. uh, wait, are you a zoologist? No, I'm a nerd with an internet connection yeah. telling you what you saw. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the people, they live there. They know the animals there. And yes, I believe a lot of times, even them are mistaken. Yeah. Again, you see something, it's like you see tracks. Oh my God, there's some movement. There's some long reddish brown fur, maybe black fur. It's really weird, very wiry. You know, there's weird stuff happens. Your imagination starts running wild. You hear a roar, 
And to you, that's the Yeti. Speaking of the roars, I did want to mention something that our group dug up. I actually asked the ARC to look for this, and that is the sound of the snow leopard, because Dr. Taylor had conjectured that a lot of people were hearing the snow leopard, which is a very creepy sound. I had the ARC dig some of those sounds up, and I'm going to have Ryan plug some of those in right here for you guys to listen to. So you can see where that might be pretty unnerving. <laughs> the ones I saw, it was like it was like an ow. Yeah, like you got you know somebody stepped on your foot. Kind yeah, of sound. but but unnerving. <laughs> it's like the goat scream. It's too human. It's yeah. something weird about that. Well, the Sherpa family we heard from, Dawa's family, has particular respect for the power of its roar. And Dawa, via his uncle Pemba, according to their forefathers, when somebody heard a yeti, the whole body got the chills. And if you actually came across one you'd be completely paralyzed with fear. You could not do anything. So if it attacked you, you would just become completely paralyzed, and that's what a Yeti would do to you. So it's like you can't even defend yourself. Yeah. It's almost a mystical power where you're frozen in your tracks. Black-eyed kid. Yes, that one is that you start to uh, open the door when you don't really want in. to. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. but that's it. Or the sleep paralysis things, the shadow people, there is a power that's higher. But if you go back to what we talked about in part two about Shambhala and right. this mythical creature that guards the entrance there, sure, it's got powers. Yeah. And if it's something like that that's coming down, it's not leaving tracks, and, right, it, and right. it will control you if it wants to. If that's what the Yeti is. <laughs> if that's what it is. I always return to my one slightly paranormal experience with Marty out in the desert hearing the roar, which I just bored the people at the meetup with. <laughs> yes, yes. That's yes. all I got to talk about. I'm sorry, folks. That happened to me. But the idea was that it was a deep, guttural growl, but it didn't really put that sense of fear in me. We didn't know where it was coming from. That was the, such the weird thing about it. You know what I'm saying? You're looking around like, what? what, what it's not bouncing off the ionosphere. Where is that coming from? Where is this thing? And the fear or the caution part of it was, well, since we don't know what it is that's making such a deep, low, like a lion growl, we should get out of here. Yeah. Because we're not going to wait to see what it is. Right. So my point is that this is different, I think, with the Sherpas, the indigenous peoples who have been in the area for hundreds of years, believe is that when you hear it, it's so frightening. There's something so powerful and magical about it that you are powerless against it. So a couple of things that I, I just want to kind of reiterate what Professor Taylor was saying is that every culture has its wild man legends. Australia has its Yowie. Actually, one of our members of the ARC, uh, I think he's Australian, I was talking about the Yowie and that that's more of a wild man. Yes. The Aboriginal indigenous peoples of Australia will talk about. And I found this a little interesting. That was in the BBC Scotland article. I didn't talk about it then, but Scotland has its own wild man, the big gray man of Ben MacDewey. If it's Scotch Gaelic, I'm pretty sure I'm getting that wrong, <laughs> uh, but it's M-A-C-D-U-I. So Ben MacDewey, I don't know. I'm okay. sure. well, our Scottish folks, please tell us how to say that. But it is said to haunt the UK's second highest mountain. Scientific explanations for the Scottish creature include a meteorological phenomenon known as the Brocken Spectre, which causes a person's shadow to be cast on a low cloud. That's fascinating. Yeah, you know what? I've seen images of that. Just oh. this past year, somebody sent us a picture. of. It. But now I can't remember if that was After Effects or something, but it was somehow what you just said right. came up as a possible explanation. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's yeah. fascinating. But again, they have their own legend. I just want to kind of restate my thinking of it. About the whole Yeti deal. Again, I believe, of course, the DNA sampling that those samples that came back that were analyzed, yeah, it's Himalayan, Asiatic, brown, and black bears. No reason to doubt that. But the analogy that I like to use is that imagine that you were there with like five, six climbers on a, a mountain climbing tour, some kind of weird creature you have never seen before. And you're not sure what it is. You've also seen bears in zoos and, and on TV. You know what a bear looks like. It's not exactly that, and it's not exactly some kind of mountain orangutan or gorilla, but something just weird, possibly cryptid, some kind of man-beast thing, chases you up a tree, okay? And then uh, eventually it gets bored, it doesn't want to chase you up the tree anymore, it just want to scare you, it goes away. 
but it leaves some hair on the tree or maybe a dookie at the base. Well, you, you analyze that. I love the word dookie. Uh, me too. <laughs> but you analyze that. It's like, well, okay, I guess we were mistaken. I guess it's the bear. You know, we ran it several times. It's just a weird big bear that didn't really look like a bear that we've ever seen. You have to go with that. Why? Because you saw it leave the evidence. What I think that's happening here, where it's mystery solved with a bear, is that you came upon a tree and you saw a huge tuft of long black fur or hair, and you have that analyzed, and it comes back, and it's like, yeah, it's a brown or black Himalayan bear. Well, that makes sense, but you can't say it's from a Yeti, because you didn't see something that was weird and Yeti-like leave it there. You know what I'm saying? You just found some hair. So that's kind of, to simplify that, I kind of want to make that point. Until we see, you know, something that... We get pictures of or video and it looks weird and then we analyze some evidence from that. I'll still keep open the possibility that, yes, a lot of these are bears and then maybe there's something that isn't a bear that's roaming around that the Sherpas all claim exists. Well, on that note, I wanted to touch on one last brief little anecdote that we wanted to share that it takes this squarely away from the idea of it being a bear. We joke about this offline, but this is the dateline, but what if <laughs> moment, uh, the, you know, the whole but then Morrison. it wasn't a bear. Yeah. <laughs> but let's just hear this story. This is from a book called Learning Love from a Tiger, Religious Experiences with Nature by Daniel Capper. This anecdote is actually turned up in a couple of different places, but this is the only one I was able to source it to today. This is on page 181 of that book in a chapter called Friendly Yetis. Around 1904, a British soldier named William Hugh Knight claimed to physically encounter a yeti near Gangtok, Sikkim. In describing this yeti to the Times in 1921, Knight said, He was a little under six feet high, almost stark naked in that bitter cold. It was the month of November. He was kind of pale yellow all over, a shock of matted hair on his head, little hair on his face highly splayed feet, and large, formidable hands. His muscular development in his arms, thighs, legs, back, and chest were terrific. He had in his hands what seemed to me to be some form of primitive bow. He did not see me, but stood there, and I watched for some five or six minutes. So far as I could make out, he was watching some man or beast far down the hillside. At the end of some five minutes, he started off on a run down the hill, and I was impressed with the tremendous speed at which he traveled. So, what was that? <laughs> As a naked dude with a bow, yeah, that's a wild man. That's a bun manchi. That's something completely different yeah. in a lot of ways. Right. But he says, for him, that's what the Yeti is. And that's kind of what Dr. Taylor talks about. People are seeing Yetis. What is the Yeti? It's all of these things. It's all these things, and in context, it's just as real. In the larger realm of our human imagination, in the human context, it's no less real, even though all the interviewers ask Dr. Taylor, what is this? Just tell us what this is, and we can move on and forget about all this nonsense. Yeah. That's what everybody wants, but what he's saying, Dr. Taylor, is that it's so much more than that, and that's what I hope we all gathered from this interview, is that it's folklore, it's legend, it's the human social context, it's ecology, it's our communion with nature, and the more we get away from that, the less human we'll be. Well, for us, there's no question that Dr. Taylor figured out what left that footprint, but even he will tell you that the Shipton footprint is only part of what the Yeti is. And at this point, Forrest and I will remind you that many of the anecdotes we shared described a creature that was clearly seen and was not a bear. This mythic beast demands respect across the planet. It is part of multiple cultures in the Himalayan region, and within each one of these cultures, it has many variations. As Dr. Taylor said, it's a representation of mankind's relationship with the wild and, frankly, it's our opinion that it does not serve us well to completely solve the mystery of its existence, if in doing so, we further cut the last of what ties us to the earth. Well, 
Well, that's going to wrap up 2017 for Astonishing Legends. A very special thanks to Dr. Daniel C. Taylor. Please pick up his book, Yeti, The Ecology of a Mystery. Yes, and as always, special thanks again to The Ark, who did an outstanding job researching this series, especially Tess Feifel. And ARC members Dr. Chris Cogswell, Marie Mayhew, Marissa Ball, Quaid Joslin, Stephanie Schmidt, Michelle Broom, Cody Rice, Joyce Diplock, Brian Gaynor, and Lachlan Wart. And the new Kids in the ARC green room who contributed. Please remember to support our sponsors. They keep the show free and the lights on in Blanket Fortiana. Special thanks to John Bolin. I'm Ken. Hi, I'm Kirby. I understand. Hi, I'm Kirby. And I give permission. Hi, I'm Kirby. Galaxy wide. Hi, I'm Kirby. Our show is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell, and the theme is by Judson Crane. Sound design is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to the ARC and its lead researcher, Tess Feifel. But most importantly, we want to thank our listeners. You can find us online at astonishinglegends.com, as well as Facebook, Patreon, Twitter, and Instagram. Copyright Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Good night. Oh, <laughs>